The validator wants to listen and understand each partner's point of view, and this is on the website, so don't freak out trying to write everything. They value the other person while disagreeing. They like to problem solve rather than argument. Let's negotiate and compromise. The problem with compromises is both people are unhappy about it. So not everything in life should be a compromise. Sometimes you just need to step up, especially you guys, okay? Women have a much less hard time stepping up and standing up for what they believe in in a relationship. But guys have been trained in our society that you need to make her happy. If you guys get in an argument and she gets mad, then what are you supposed to do? Apologize. Apologize. What if she's wrong? What have you been told to do? Still do it. Still apologize. Okay? And so now you have men who don't have a backbone, because that's what they've been told is the right thing to do in a relationship, which pisses her off even more, right? Yeah. Okay? Uh, so that's causing problems. And then he is resentful. He's so resentful of the fact that he's given everything up, and he has to apologize when you're the one that's in the wrong, and makes him bitter, and that is not a good recipe for a successful marriage. Okay? So guys you need to learn not to do that. It's terrible relationship advice that the world's given. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I do with couples is this exercise for men. I draw two circles. I'll do one bigger. Okay. I draw two circles. And, um, does any guy want to volunteer for this? Sure. Okay. So, what in life is so important to who you are, it defines who you are. That if you gave it up, you would be giving up yourself. Okay. And what I believe in. Moral values. Can you give a couple examples? Sure, I believe in not drinking or smoking. Okay, good one. Not drinking or smoking. Okay, so these would be two big ones that you couldn't give up. So now imagine you marry a girl who, she's great, you know, everybody likes her, but she's a bit of a partier, she likes to drink. Would that bother you? A you little drink? bit. It would bother you a little bit. Okay. So when it bothers you a little bit, that's something that we sometimes will compromise on. But now, she's kind of nagging you. Like, oh, come on, you need to relax. You never have a good time. Just like, have a little drink or whatever. Now here's the thing. If you give in to her, how, how does that affect you as a person? Well, it means uh, I gave in and give my moral values for someone else. And what does that say about who you are? It says that I'll give in to anything you know I don't want to. So you'll give in to anything. Like you said, you're weak. You've given up who you are. You've lost some part of who you are if it's that important to you. And this is what men tend to do in relationships all the time. Now, women do this too in different ways. But men, this is a consistent issue that I see in relationships. So this inner circle of values is what is integral to who you are. And if you give up something on this, then you, it makes you very angry, very resentful. But you've been taught you should give up on everything in order to make your wife happy. And then what we see is the things that aren't important to you. Like, um, is helping with the housework important to you? Okay. So she asks you, take the trash out. Okay? This is in the outer circle of importance. It's not that big of a deal. But you've given up something that's important to you. And so deep down you say, screw you. I'm not doing that. Happens all the time in relationships. And then you forget. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I forgot to take the trash. But I'll take it out tomorrow. And then you forget again. And she's like, why won't you do anything I ask him to do? Well, because he has given up, whether through your pressure or the fact that he can't stand up on his own and he doesn't have enough backbone to do it. Could be either way or both. It's usually both ways. He's given up something that's super integral to himself. Now, one of the problems is a lot of times women ask men to give up something, to compromise on something, and they don't know it's that important to you. Because men tend not to be emotionally expressive and to share their really inner vulnerable side. And so we don't know that drinking is that big of a deal to you, or not drinking, okay, for instance. Or um, one couple I had, him playing basketball with his buddies. Doesn't seem like a big deal to me. Like if I ask you, oh, you know, I don't want you to go do that this week, let's go to movies or do something fun. Doesn't seem like a big deal to me. But in this couple, that was his time to, to decompress to deal with his stuff in his life. He talked to them about personal issues, and if he was having a problem with his wife, 
he said, he asked him for advice. What should I do? What's the best way to handle this? And so it was super important to him. But she nagged him, and, oh, come on, do something fun. Why do you always have to go out with them? Don't you care about me? You know, the classic female stuff. And so he gave up that thing that was super important to him. And after that, no end of refusing to give up on the less important stuff. Okay. So it happens all the time. But I think this is an important lesson for men and women, because it does happen to both of us. You have to stand up for the things that are truly important to you, and then compromise on the stuff that's not that big of a deal. If it doesn't matter to you whether you're helping with the dishes or not, then just help with the dishes. But if you're resentful and you're refusing to help with something that's not that big of a deal, or refusing to compromise on something that's not that big of a deal, then you have to ask yourself, what did I compromise on that was a big deal? Okay. Um, I had another one where uh, not doing housework, no housework, was an important thing. This guy was an entrepreneur, he had a business, he was wearing like 80 hours a week to get this business off the ground. And his wife was like, you know, apology, you should be doing the dishes and blah, blah, blah. And he was just like, I don't have time to do this. I cannot do it. Now, I don't believe she should be doing all these dishes and she should just be doing the housework. It has nothing to do with gender. I just cannot do this. And so it was one of those areas where he could not compromise on. And so what they finally ended up doing is paying a little bit of money for somebody to come in and do a bit of housework. But he was resentful, he was nasty about it, he was passive aggressive, because in his mind, I'm a husband, I'm supposed to compromise on everything. Whatever she wants, I'm supposed to give her to make her happy. But that's not how a good relationship works. Okay? So validators are much more likely to do this. I want you to feel good, so I'll compromise. But that could make you miserable. Okay, the we-ness of a relationship. We're a team, we work together. We need to stay close. It's important. But it can also become just an arrangement and not something that's passionate. Okay, we're business partners. Volatiles do not have that problem. They fight on a grand scale, make up on a grand scale. Very engaged with each other, very emotionally intense, very emotionally connected. They see themselves as equal in the relationship, which is why they're willing to argue it out. <coughs> Easily express feelings, opinions, and thoughts, but they can have way too much fighting. This is the couple that has the police called on them. Okay, breaks the plates. But they tend to enjoy. Now, you might ask yourself, which one of these are you? And you think, well, I get into fights with people that drive me crazy, and so I must be volatile. The question is, do you enjoy it? I get into fights with people. My sister is volatile. We get into fights. Okay? Even as adults, we'll still fight with each other. But I hate it. It makes me physically uncomfortable to do it. I do not enjoy it. There's nothing about an argument that I enjoy. I'll do it if it's important, but that's a typical validator. I'll fight over something, but I don't like to do it. She loves it. It's not, it energizes her. <laughs> Makes her feel good to have a fight. Okay? An avoider, it's painful. It's not just uncomfortable. You hate it. You would do almost anything to avoid a fight. You may still get into it if it's necessary, but you hate it. Okay. So that helps you to determine which one you are. And in the book, there are quizzes. So if you're still not sure, take the quiz and see which one. All right, and then the avoider is a conflict minimizer. They agree to disagree. Um, very low level of companionship. Sometimes they just end up roommates because they're not engaging with each other. Very individualistic, which has its benefits. Um, but and, and they can get along just fine like that until there's a problem that's too big to just ignore. Okay. And then that could destroy their relationship, because at some point you have to deal with them. Right. So again, all three of these can work if they're equal. If they're mismatched, you're, you're in big trouble. Okay? You don't want all these mismatches to happen. So consider that, and all of you are single, consider that with who you're dating or who you date in the future. Okay, so let's talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. What is this? Oh, um, you mean by definition? Yeah. Well, the there are four, oh. to be specific. Um, yeah. War, war, death, death, pestilence, death, pestilence, death, pestilence and famine. 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 Good. Yeah. All right, so if you've ever read the Bible, in Revelation, it predicts the end of the world, including the zombie apocalypse. Okay? It says in the Revelation that the dead will rise and walk the earth. Tell me that's not zombies. Okay? 
It does not mention any brain eating, but I am pretty confident that will happen. Wait, what says that? Revelations. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last book of the Bible. It says in the Bible right now. Apocalypse? Yeah. What? The end times. That's what the word apocalypse comes from the Bible. Oh. Yeah. That's okay. comforting. Okay. The Bible says that there will be a person who arises from politics and he unites the world, which is why Christians get really freaked out about this whole one world thing. He creates a one world currency, unites all the countries under his government. And for three and a half years, it goes great. And then after that, he starts to persecute people, particularly Christians, but just anybody who disagrees with him, and mainly by um, beheading them, which is sort of interesting considering how the Middle East takes care of issues. Um, <laughs> and then just basically, kind of, literally, all hell breaks loose, and um, there is a mountain that explodes and falls into the ocean and poisons the oceans, which a lot of people believe is a nuclear power plant exploding and poisoning the waters. Like a third of the fish die. I mean, it's just awful. So these four horsemen are metaphors for all of this insanity that will happen at the end of the world. So pestilence, which is um, disease, which makes sense if a lot of people and animals are dying, there's going to be a lot of disease. Uh, warfare, which will of course help create death and famine and disease. Okay. So those are the four horsemen, and they, in a metaphorical sense, trample the earth underneath their hooves. So John Gottman, who's Jewish, although Jews don't believe in Revelation, but he's familiar with it, as most Jews are, uh, he said that there are four horsemen of the relationship apocalypse. So these are four communication behaviors we use in an argument with each other that trampled our relationship into the ground. So these four things, um, they predict, what he's been able to do is get a couple to come in, do an argument, and he analyzes it. And after only five minutes of watching them argue, he can predict whether or not they'll divorce in the next five or so years, five or seven years, with 96% accuracy, just based on these four communication tactics. Okay? So I think him calling them the four horsemen of the relationship apocalypse is pretty darn accurate. Okay? If you are doing these four things, you almost guarantee you'll divorce, especially if you don't change your behavior. Now, the good thing is you can be aware of these because you have a wonderful professor who's teaching them to you. And if you see them cropping up in a relationship, you may be able to fix it in time. Okay. So let's go through these. The first one is criticism. This is attacking a person's personality, attacking who they are, their character. You're lazy. You don't care about me. You always screw things up. You know, group comments. But it's attacking who they are. It's not saying, it drives me crazy when you leave your laundry lying around. It's saying, why are you too lazy to pick this stuff up and put it in the laundry basket? And we fall into this all the time, really easily. Okay, it happens. We all do it. But it's not good for your relationships. So, we pass judgment on a person. Maybe we bring up their history. I have been married to you for 10 years, and there has not been one day when you have put your laundry in the basket. And what does that really say? What's wrong with you? You're screwed up. You're lazy. You're incompetent. You don't care. Bringing in that history is evidence to convict the other person of how terrible they are. That's why we do it. And then indicating lack of trust in the spouse, just like we saw in that video. My mom told me, she warned me, I should have listened to my sister. Okay. What is that saying about the other person? There is something wrong with who they are, their personality or their character. Okay. So complaining is okay. I hate when you do this. Can you please put your laundry in the basket? That's okay. But saying, you, you're so lazy. Why don't you ever do this? And criticism also has that, has that global language. You never take me out anymore. Oh, really? Never? I took you out two months ago. That's not the point. The point is that I'm lonely and we, I feel like we don't spend enough time together. But there's a big difference between saying, hey, I'm lonely and we don't spend enough time together, and saying, you never take me out. You see the difference there? How one builds a relationship, the other one tears it apart. Okay, now, sorry ladies, I hate to say this, but who criticizes more, men or women? <laughs> women. <laughs> men criticize too, don't get me wrong, but women are more likely to criticize than men. Okay, we do it more often. Um, yeah, okay. 
Now, when you are criticized, what is your response? Defense. Defend ourselves. Well, you didn't put the basket where I could get to it easily. I keep telling you to put it in the bathroom. How is that my fault? When we defend ourselves, we're saying, I'm not responsible for this. We're trying to justify our behavior. And it tells the other person that what you have to say isn't important. It's not valid. So it invalidates the other person, which, of course, is a terrible thing for a relationship. It happens when you perceive or anticipate a threat. Okay? So you think you're going to be criticized, or you are being criticized. We want to defend ourselves from criticism. Criticisms hurt. Criticisms are generally unfair to some degree. And so we try to defend ourselves. It makes sense. It also leads to divorce. So let's say um, you promised to take the trash out. You weren't able to do it. Now trash day has passed and you've got full trash cans. And your spouse is pissed off about it and says, why didn't you take the trash out? I told you like ten times yesterday to take the trash out. What do you say? Huh? You forgot. You forgot. Or you come up with a reason. I work. I worked until like 10 o'clock last night. And you expect me to take the trash out? Right? You come up with some justification, some defense of why you didn't do it. What could you have said that would have helped the relationship? I'll do it next time. I'm sorry. I'll try to remember to do it next time. But here's the thing that Gottman has found out. Remember, 80% of problems are solvable. So yes, he probably will continue to not take the trash out and forget to do it. Okay? I'm a messy person. I'm not organized. I lose things all the time. And it drives my family crazy occasionally. Uh, I sometimes forget to put appointments into the calendar for bride tours. And then I remember like 10 minutes before a bride shows up and all of a sudden we're scattering to get everything together happens. I'm not an organized person. I don't care how mad they get at me. It's not going to change it. Okay? And so I've told them, I'm not doing this anymore. This is not my strength. I'm great with interacting with people, building relationships, whatever, all that therapist stuff. But I'm not doing this calendar crap anymore. I'm not taking care of the finances anymore. That is not my thing. It's never going to get fixed. But I could be really angry about it. I could be really defensive about it. And it's just going to end up upsetting people. What defensiveness does is it escalates the anger instead of de-escalating it. But what I can do is take responsibility. I'm really sorry for my lack of organization with this. I totally get why you guys are upset. Totally get it. I'm responsible for this. However, we need to do something different. See how different that is from defending myself? I could be saying, well, you guys are always putting this on me. Why don't you do anything? Why don't you take care of this? And I've asked you a million times, which I have, for them to do it, and somehow it keeps getting back to me. So I could attack back. That's what defensiveness really is. I'm not responsible. It's not my fault. And most likely, it's somebody else's fault. That does not build a relationship. Yeah? How do you get them to stop being defensive? Number one, stop criticizing. And then don't react to the defensiveness. And then you keep trying to um, just tr keep trying to get to the main point. So if they're being defensive, you ignore all the defensive stuff and just try to interpret what their main point is. So if I got defensive at my family and I was like, well, I ask you guys to do this all the time, blah, 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 then my family's proper response should be, okay, so what you're saying is that you don't want to do this anymore and it's too much for you. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So ignore all the fact that I attack them and just go to what the central point is. Because people attack, or people defend themselves because they feel like they're being attacked. And you may not be attacking them. That's one of the, the crappy parts of defensiveness. You may be being totally nice, but they think they're being attacked, or they're, they're afraid they're going to be attacked, and they can respond defensively. So if you can show them, I'm not criticizing you, and you can be as defensive as you want, but I'm still going to focus on your responsibility, then eventually they'll calm down. Assuming that they're a goodwill person and not a, a jerk or an abuser, then they'll eventually calm down and be able to deal with it. Yeah, good question. Okay, so denying responsibility, making excuses, um, disagreeing with my dream. Yes, but 
okay? Yes, it's my fault, but here's this huge excuse. Uh, rubber man, rubber woman, it's not my fault, it's your fault. Like once when I was a teenager, I left the gate open and all of our dogs escaped. Oh. And my mom, of course, was mad at me. Makes sense. And my response, look, I didn't get slapped, was, well, you left the gate open last week. Oh, oh that does not go over well in my household, okay? Was I correct? Yeah. But what I was saying is, well, I'm not taking responsibility for this. That does not build a relationship, okay? Or whining, complaining, or as my, my sister's niece, or my sister's daughter, my niece, will say all the time, sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. Again, that's defensiveness, isn't it? I, I'm apologizing, but I'm not really. And by saying sorry, I'm saying I'm not sorry. Sorry, but not sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right, so result, obstructs communication, escalates conflict. Defensiveness does not help. Who is more defensive, ladies? Boys. Boys. <laughs> boys are more defensive, okay? <laughs> Girls can get defensive too, but boys are much more likely to become defensive. So here's the thing. We get conflict escalation, and eventually we get stonewalling, which is physiological flooding that makes us just cut off, okay? So, maybe that's what this slide said. Let's see. All right, yeah. So, there's a physiological component. When you argue with somebody, your muscles get tense, your adrenaline is flowing, your blood pressure is high, your pulse is high, right? We've all been there, your face gets red. Men get that way faster than women, okay? This is probably why they're more defensive. So, it takes less negativity for husbands to become overwhelmed, or for men to become overwhelmed. Their blood pressure goes up faster, it goes up higher, it stays that way longer, so it takes them longer to calm down. Okay. Which is why men are less likely to want to argue than a woman. It makes sense that women need to be able to handle conflict because we tend to be around other women more in family situations, you're dealing with your children's emotionality, you need to be able to stay calm. Men, historically, have been the ones that go out and, you know, hunt the woolly mammoth and fight the wars. So they need to get worked up really fast. I mean, the Vikings had berserkers. Men who were able to work themselves up so intensely that they were wheeled onto the battlefield in cages and then released. And then the, their side would scatter to get away from them because they killed anybody. Okay? Those, that was a real thing. Okay? So that's how men can get in an argument with you too, ladies. Which is why men are also more likely to perpetrate domestic violence. Now, one of the reasons why, um, one of the things men do in order to stop domestic violence is what we call stonewall. Okay, now women do this too when we get overwhelmed. Um, and by the way, overwhelming, we call flooding, Gottman calls flooding. And then that creates stonewall. I know this argument's going somewhere bad. I can feel myself getting overwhelmed. I'm either going to say something or physically do something that I don't want to do. And so I'm walking away. Or I'm not talking to you anymore. Or I'm going to turn the TV on and pretend you're not there. Or I'm going to get out of the car and walk away. Slam out of the house. Okay? Everybody been there? Men are much more likely to stonewall, although women certainly stonewall too. I've done my fair share of stonewall. Especially with my older sister, who's the volatile person. Okay? So you get overwhelmed. Psychologically and physiologically flooded. And then you end up stonewalling in order to shut it down. Okay, so communication has broken down, you're flooded. Men are more likely to stonewall. Uh, no, I wrote that down wrong. Men are more likely to stonewall and respond defensively than women. Okay. Women do stonewall though. But here's the interesting factor. Um, women, or, or let's go with the guys first. Okay, men, if she is in an argument with you, um, and she shuts down and stops talking. What goes through your head? Not sure? Okay, ladies, when you're in an argument with him and he stops talking to you, what goes through your mind? What was that? He's bad. He's bad. No, he's mad. Oh, he's mad? Okay, he's mad. He's irritated, doesn't want to talk. What does that mean to you that he doesn't want to talk? He doesn't care. Anything else? He's trying to avoid you, avoid the conversation. He's thinking about what he's going to say. He's what? He's like thinking about what he's going to say. He's thinking about what he's going to say. 
He doesn't want to deal with the situation. Doesn't want to deal with the situation. Which, if he doesn't want to deal with the situation, what does it mean? He thinks he's right. He doesn't care. He doesn't want to fix it. He thinks he's right. He's right. Okay. Um, now, you ladies are young, so maybe this hasn't gone quite as intense with you. Or maybe you haven't been in a relationship to experience it. Um, but I guarantee when I talk to my older female students, they go to, he doesn't care. He doesn't love me anymore. He's cheating on me. Oh my God, he's going to leave me. How am I going to raise my children? And all of a sudden it becomes this panic response. Okay? And guys, when she shuts up and stops talking to you, you go, I finally shut up. Now I can calm down. Okay? And so when men stonewall, it's usually they're trying to do the honorable thing. I know this is going somewhere bad, so I'm going to shut this down before it gets there. They're trying to do the right thing. But when women perceive it, they go, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't love me anymore. Maybe he doesn't want to be married anymore. Maybe he's cheating on me. I'm telling you, their mind goes there like that. It takes roughly two seconds to get to that point. Women have an extra gland. Guys, take notes. Women have an extra gland that you don't have. It's called an insecurity gland. And when you stop talking to her, it spasms and releases insecurity hormones all throughout the body. Okay? I've never met a woman who isn't like that. Every female's mind goes directly to, he's going to fail. Okay? In two seconds. Tops. Tops. Two seconds. Okay? And you girls are all laughing and smiling because you know deep down that's true. Okay? That's true. And that makes sense, okay? It makes sense because here's the thing. If you have little babies that need to be taken care of, it's hard for you to take care of them solely by yourself. It's hard to be a single mom. It helps to have a dad around to, to care for them, to provide for them. And so the survival part of your brain goes, pay attention for any sign that he's going to leave you. You need to be prepared. You need to stop it because this is a survival issue. You could die. Your babies could die if he leaves you. Because in a more primitive culture, that is what would happen. And so the woman's brain is programmed to always be insecure about whether he's going to leave or not. And so it takes roughly two seconds, or more like 0.2 seconds, to go from we're having a basic argument over socks to he has another woman on the side and he's planning to leave. <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's how the brain works. So here's the thing. When men stonewall, huge predictor of divorce. By itself, it's roughly like 85% predictor of divorce. When women stonewall, it doesn't predict anything. <laughs> doesn't create any problems for the relationship. So ladies, don't think you're punishing him by, uh, by not talking to him. It's not doing anything. It's making him feel better. Okay? Um, so yeah, men stonewalling, bad thing. Women stonewalling, doesn't, doesn't actually matter. 